How's everybody doing this morning? Yes, so 20 years ago today, we answered the call. And uh, 20 years ago today, I was in the mountains of Afghanistan, uh, company commander, uh, lead my men uh, to, to take those people that did this, to, to, to find them and to destroy them. So good morning. I, as you know, I'm Colonel Kraft. It's my pleasure to, to talk with you on this 20th anniversary of Operation Anaconda. Uh, you can see down at the bottom there, you know, now I'm the executive director, but back then I was a company commander. And you can see here's my battalion crest, first battalion of the 87th Infantry. We were attached to the Rakasan Brigade from the 101st, and then the Rakasans were attached to the 10th Mountain Division. So uh, pretty, pretty unique command relationship, but uh, we'll get into that uh, throughout the briefing. Next slide, please. Okay, so right after the president spoke, a few weeks later, uh, my company, along with the rest of my battalion is pretty unique. We're the first ones to fly to Uzbekistan, okay? Because we went to Uzbekistan to, as a staging base for all combat forces as we took the fight to the enemy uh, in Afghanistan. So you can kind of see September, October was all about reception, staging, and onward integration. And once we kind of had things set there at this uh, Karshi Kanembad airfield, uh, we called back to the United States and said, okay, we're ready to receive 5th Special Forces Group, okay? So if any, if any of you have kind of uh, studied or, or saw things about the fight after 9-11, after you see Special Forces uh, on horseback, you know, leading, you know, warlord, you know, forces over in Afghanistan. It, it, it was all true, all right? But before they could get on their horses, they had to come through us, all right? So we received them, and basically, once they got on ground, they, they started conducting combat operations in Afghanistan, and, and we were their backup, okay? Uh, we did that all the way up until November, at which point in time, the, the 5th Special Forces Group was like, you know, this is taking too much time coming in and out of Uzbekistan. We are ready to establish bases of operation inside of Afghanistan. So guess what? We're, Special Forces, they are awesome, but they're, they're, they don't know how to set up bases, okay? And, and quite honestly, infantry battalions don't either, but we, we bring a lot more soldiers to the fight. So they came to us and said, all right, hey, 187 Infantry, can you all move into Afghanistan with us and establish bases of operation. We said, absolutely. So Bravo Company went to uh, Bagram Airfield. And, and I know some of, the, some, of the, some of the soldiers in the back there probably went through Bagram Airfield countless times. Uh, B, B Company was the first one to go on to, go on to Bagram Airfield and establish that base of operations in order to allow special forces to conduct operations. My company, Charlie Company, went to an airfield called Mazar Sharif, uh, airfield Mazar Sharif, which was in northern Afghanistan. Uh, and, and at those two places, again, we established bases of operation. But more importantly, once we received the uh, special forces there, we started conducting QRF operations, quick reaction force. So as a special force team was conducting operations, usually with some sort of Afghanistan uh, partnership, okay, that started early on, if anything went bad, they called us. So the first call we got was, uh, there, there was a, a, a prison uh, in northern Afghanistan that uh, th the special forces were, were securing to conduct interrogations and get intelligence for further operations. Well, during that, the, the enemy retook the prison. And uh, so that was actually our first taste. That was in November. I think it was, it might have been, 
the day before, day after Thanksgiving. But that was our first real uh, engagement for, for as far as conventional forces against the enemy in, in northern Afghanistan. And uh, we had to help our, our special forces partners retake the prison. And we did, okay? But, but in that, you can see right here, and, you know, Mike Spann. Mike Spann was a Marine that left the Marine Corps and then went on to be a uh, CI, work for the CIA. And he was there doing very important work. But he was killed uh, in that prison uprising. And actually, my company uh, uh, put him on a helicopter and uh, brought him back up to Uzbekistan so he could go back uh, to the United States. So uh, pretty crazy. Also around that time, and, and I, I see Sergeant Major Greer sitting up there. His brother was in another part of Afghanistan. We got an intel report that Osama bin Laden, you know, we, we found him. And, and we're going to go after him. So, so, so and, and Sergeant Major Greer's brother worked with some, you got special forces, then you got some really special forces. He was working with those guys, and they went after him. Uh, but unfortunately, the, the terrain was, was out of control, uh, and, and it was very, very hard to, to fight, you know, to get to bin Laden and kill him. So now, whether he was ever there, you know, we believe he was, but bottom line, we had him in our sights, and, uh, and, and the operation just, it, it was not successful in finding and, and capturing Osama bin Laden. But the good thing was, is we learned a lot from that operation, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And then, kind of December, January, February, uh, the, the fight was going very well in Afghanistan. Uh, this, the, the special forces teams were partnering with the, these, these groups of Afghans that had been, you know, just, just living a terrible life. The, you know, under the Taliban rule, uh, all these different terrorist groups. If you were a terrorist group back in 2001, 2002, you, and, and you wanted to get better at your trade, you wanted, to, you wanted to go and train, you went to Afghanistan. So it was just a terrible place. So when the United States got there, you know, to handle business from 9-11, the Afghan people absolutely loved it. And they wanted to do everything they could to help us get their country back. Okay, get their country back from the Taliban, get their, their country back from Al-Qaeda, get their country back from almost every terrorist group in the world. All right? So anyway, in December, January, February, we were having prisons uh, all over Afghanistan that they did not want to have a repeat of what happened you know, up north with Mike Spann, more prison uprisings. So then uh, the 187 Infantry started doing uh, more security operations and holding those uh, prisons, securing those prisons, so nothing would go, nothing would go wrong. And I, and I would tell you, that was, that was high adventure. Real quick story, my company uh, contracted a bunch of old, you know, trucks, civilian trucks in uh, Mazar Sharif, and we drove them across northern Afghanistan to uh, establish a base of operations to, to secure one of these prisons. I'm going to tell you, that's just, you know, as you enter your as you enter the military, all right, you're gonna you're gonna be you're gonna be trained very well at your trade, okay, and and as officers, you know you're gonna be expected to lead those organizations. But I'm here to tell you right now, never in my wildest dreams did I think I was gonna be having my soldiers getting a bunch of civilian trucks in northern Afghanistan to drive across the north. Okay, in, in very dangerous uh, terrain, and, and, and enemy, you know, enemy was there to set up, you know, a site to secure a prison, and then ultimately get some of those uh, some of those bad guys back to back to quite honestly Gitmo, Cuba. Okay, which is where that operation started. We were the first ones to send the first plane load of of enemy high level enemy combatants. Uh, to to uh, Guantanamo Bay and to that prison. So anyway, that's kind of, we're doing those prison operations, 
So here we are, December. It's just one infantry battalion and one special forces group. Well, at the higher levels of our, our, of our leadership in the Department of Defense, they're like, okay, it's time to take this fight a little further, okay? We think they need more combat power on the ground in Afghanistan to be more successful. So at that point in time, they sent the Rakasans, 3rd Brigade, 101st. Again, the ones I talked about up here. And then, uh, and they also sent a division headquarters. So the very unique command relationship, and just so you're all tracking, that's not normal. You know, usually, you know, things changed on how fighting units were organized because of how things went in Afghanistan early on. All right, so infantry battalion, working for a brigade from another division, working for a division that wasn't theirs. And it just so happened it was our parent division. So very, very, very unique. Threw up some pictures. You can see special forces there on their horseback just doing their thing, doing an absolutely fantastic job. Uh, these are two of my soldiers from 1st Platoon uh, taking the prison back, which was pretty neat. Uh, we had no idea. It was on the cover of time. When I got back from Afghanistan, I'm like, holy smokes, look at all this. Uh, and then a very, very unfortunate uh, all-American hero. I could spend all morning talking about Mike Spann, but, uh, but I'm not going to. Next slide, please. Okay, so we, we, we've been in country for a hot minute now, and now we've got a division headquarters, all right? A division headquarters brings a lot more intelligence gathering to the fight. Okay, on the ground, we've taken it about as far as we can gather in our own, own intelligence. So now we've got the division headquarters there tapping into national resources on gaining more intelligence so we can conduct operations. Okay, so learn some lessons from Tora Bora. We think had we maybe committed a few more troops to that, we might have been more successful. We we're getting intel reports that down over here, near the uh, Pakistan border that there was a congregation of, of multiple terrorist groups, okay? So it's kind of, if you can kind of imagine it, over here's the rest of Afghanistan, all these, horse, all these special forces on horseback with a bunch of angry Afghan people trying to take their country back, and they're pushing all these, these terrorist groups, okay, and, 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 and Taliban fighters down into uh, southeastern Afghanistan and the intel folks obviously go to the commanding general and they're like sir we think we have our next operation there is a there's a you know a, a large concentration of, of enemy forces down, down at this location and uh, we need to conduct an operation and so great only I just told you the troops that were in town okay so they're like hey we're gonna conduct a major operation in southeastern Afghanistan. And I would tell you, at this point in time in the war, again, March 2nd, 2002, we were about to conduct the largest conventional ground combat operation since Vietnam. Okay? And, uh, and, it, and it, was, it was something else. So the big picture plan, so you got all these bad guys down here in, in, in this you know, basically a valley, a very, you know, very mountainous terrain in a valley. And what made, made it unique in the intel reports, they had, they, had, they had realized that they had basically supply lines running into Pakistan. So really all the base of operations that the enemy was conducting in Afghanistan at that time was coming right out of here. These bad guys it couldn't get the supplies in Afghanistan, and, and, and believe it or not, if you look at, you know, when you're on the ground, you, you don't see this line between Afghanistan and Pakistan. They had no idea they were going into Pakistan. They are just going and getting supplies in an opposite direction of where the American forces were. So the plan was, is to, was to do some pre-assault fires, all right, send in the Air Force, because, oh, by the way, we didn't have any artillery with us. All right, that was the decision. We were going to go and do this fight light. So no artillery. It's the only firepower we had other than what we had on ourselves, you know, was, was the Air Force. So you, you Falcons, I know you're, you're loving to hear that, all right? Uh, but they were going to conduct some pre-assault fires, 
and basically get those enemy forces, keep them in position, all right, so we can go in and preferably capture them so we can gain more intelligence, okay? So they're going to conduct pre-assault fires around the enemy, along these, these, these supply lines, and then once the fire stopped, then they were going to send the infantry in. And, and I was fortunate enough to be a company commander in the 10th Mountain, 10th Mountain Division, working for the 101st at this point in time. So we're the, all the infantry, we're going to go in and, and block all of these. Now, instead of supply lines, we call them exfiltration lines. Okay, we wanted to keep the enemy right where they were. And then what the division had done was taken the special forces to partner further uh, with, at this point, we're actually trying, we're, we're, it's the very beginning of putting together a military force for the Afghan people. Okay? And, and, uh, we called them at that point in time, we wouldn't hear this now, but they're the anti-Taliban forces, all right? And we found this, this old Afghan, he was a warlord, but uh, his name was Zia. And he, he, he and his uh, people were the, were the best fighters that we had come across down in that part of Afghanistan. So Air Force goes in, blow, you know, blow, you know, keeps the enemy right where we want them, all right? The infantry goes in, sets up blocking positions, and then the special forces with these Afghan forces were going to go in to this objective area and kill or capture the enemy. So that's the big picture plan. Next slide, next slide, please. What actually happened? Remember, enemy always gets a vote. Okay, what actually happened? Well, so you know, you saw the bigger picture. So this is more of a blow up of the objective area, okay, objective Remington, and, and it's kind of hard to see in this thing, but there, you know, there's a, three towns, Marzak, Babakel, and Sirkinkiel. Um, but you can see all these blocking positions here. This was, this was again, the plan, kind of putting it all together. Well, first thing, as we're on our, on our Chinooks, heading into this, you know, to, to take up our blocking positions. My battalion commander, who's now a four-star general and in charge of uh, all U.S. forces in Korea, uh, yells to me, Nelson, sir, pre-assault fires didn't go in. Roger. No idea why. There's some books written on it, what happened, but the pre-assault fires never went in. Uh, and, and then, come to find out, you know how we if the pre-assault fires didn't go in, we don't know if they had, they had intel, intelligence that an operation was, was about to happen or not. But guess what? Instead of the enemy being nice, nicely inside this circle where we could block them and keep them, they were already in the mountainside, okay, in fortified positions, uh, basically waiting for a fight. All right? So, so obviously... <laughs> A little bit of an intel flaw there, all right? We, we lost eyes on. And then, uh, and then to, you know, to top it all off, uh, Zia down here said, yeah, we're not going. So pretty much everything that could go wrong went wrong as we were going in for this fight. No pre-assault fires. Intelligence was wrong. The enemy was right where we were planning on setting up blocking positions. And then the, the, the forces that were supposed to go in and kill and capture decided they didn't want to fight. So we landed, all right? And I'll just tell you, now I'm going to get down to the company level of, of, of what actually happened that day. And I'm going to do a quick time check. All right, we're doing good. So... Company, an infantry company back in those days, a light infantry company, had about 134 soldiers, okay? We can only get, so all these forces over here, so you see 10th Mountain, these two were mine right there, Heather and Ginger blocking positions. There's Alpha Company. Then you got all these companies, pretty much a company per blocking position. 
We used every helicopter that the 101st had at its disposal. All right? And uh, so it, down, down in the south was, was my company, and it wasn't even the whole company. We only got uh, two aircraft at that time. So do the math, how many, you know, roughly between the two aircraft, we got about, you know, 80 to eight, around 80 soldiers, all right, between the two helicopters to go in and get this and, and, and conduct this operation. So even though, and oh, by the way, as we were flying into our helicopter landing zones, uh, we knew that the pre-assault fires didn't go in, but we had no idea that the enemy wasn't where the intelligence said he was going to be. So we land in a valley surrounded by mountains and came, in, and came under uh, enemy fire immediately. And I'll tell you, those terrorist groups, you know, and, and, and it was, it was uh, uh, groups of Taliban, Al-Qaeda, and some terrorist groups that I'm not even going to get into, okay? But they were up in these fortified positions, dug in with machine guns, mortars, anti-aircraft uh, machine guns, uh, missiles, you name it. Uh, they, 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 were, uh, they were ready for a fight. And so as soon as my company landed, we got off the helicopters under fire, and we immediately shook, you know, took cover. All right, and, and this is the desert, so there's kind of little crevices and wadis all over the place. There's rocks. We're in a valley, but there was some terrain. So, you know, we're returning fire, and, and we are trying to take cover where we can so we can not only protect ourselves, but take the fight to the enemy. Within the, you know, first 30 minutes of the fight, I had 10 wounded. And oh, by the way, forgot to mention, it was about a 45-minute flight uh, from the airfield over to this location. So round trip, do the math. I mean, it, and, and oh, by the way, those helicopters, we kind of need them over there. And we're not going to, you know, purposely fly them into enemy fire. Okay? Because while this was the most important show in town right there, we knew that this fight, was gonna, this fight and this war was going to go on much, much longer. So on the ground, fighting, we're taking wounded. We can't get the wounded out. And at that point in time, these things right here absolutely became critical. Leadership. When you're in a fight like this, everyone is looking to the leadership. How is my leadership reacting? Are they calm? Are they cool? Are they sticking their chin out there too? I mean, we're all getting... We're all getting blown up here, you know, by machine gun fire and RPGs and mortars. Where's my leader? Because at that level, the soldiers are going to be like, I'm going to do whatever my leader is doing. So leadership, absolutely critical. Competence, courage, toughness, initiative. I'm going to tell you about some heroes a little bit later on of uh, some, 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 some initiative that was, was taken and some heroes were made that day. But the bottom line, for 18 hours straight, we fought with the enemy. And I would tell you, he had the upper hand first. And then it was a stalemate because of initiative and, and taking disciplined shots. I was low crawling to each one of my soldiers saying, only shoot what you can hit. Do not waste any ammo. I do not know when we're going to get resupply. Well, meanwhile, my, my ETAC back in the day, my, my, my Air Force guy who was in my hip pocket is calling everybody and every, everyone and everybody that can bring a, a, a you know, uh, attack plane, uh, what have you, into the fight to support. And, uh, and then while, while he's doing that, my battalion commander's on the radio trying to get Army aviation, attack aviation in to assist with the fight. So, and oh, by the way, we're pretty sure I had 88 soldiers on the ground. We're pretty sure we were fighting about a 350 to 400 person enemy in, in the high ground, in fortified positions, in the middle of a valley. It was awesome.
So, <laughs> anyway, uh, once the Air Force and the Navy showed up and started dropping bombs, uh, we started to get the upper hand. Once the attack aviation came in, loved them to death, but at that, at that high altitude, they, they were, they were, it, was, it, was a rough, it was rough for them. They were getting shot up pretty good. Um, and then the wonderful thing, and we landed about 6.30 in the morning. Once it got dark about 6.30 at night, the fight was ours. And you want to know why? Because we own the night. Night vision, lasers, technology, holy smokes. It was awesome. So this, this, this enemy force that was three or four, had three or four many people than we did in four to five positions. I mean, it was just, it was insane. And, but, but it was a stalemate. Why? Because we were being disciplined. All right? Our leaders were doing the right things. Our soldiers were following the leaders. We were only shooting at what we could hit. We were conserving ammo. Every time we could use a helicopter to shoot something or drop a bomb on it, that's what we did. Oh, and, and, and sorry, I almost forgot. We did have our mortars with us. And, and they were very, they, they did great things for us. So it was really an echelon of fires the whole time, minus artillery, which, God, I wish we had artillery. All right, next slide. All right, get to talk to you about some of the heroes. So uh, there's me, 30-year-old Captain Kraft, with my, my Sergeant Major, Frank Grippy. He went on to serve as the CENTCOM Sergeant Major. Uh, great American. He's a hero. I'm going to talk about him a bit. Uh, obviously threw a medal up there. But I want to start off with uh, Staff Sergeant Randy Perez. So I, like I told you, we had 10 wounded at the beginning, you know, in about the th first 30 minutes of an 18-hour fight. Um, all 10 of those wounded were in first platoon, okay? Um, about another 30 minutes later, we had nine more. So 19 wounded, uh, all, from, all from first platoon. And of the wounded was uh, the platoon leader, uh, Lieutenant Maroika from first platoon, and uh, his platoon sergeant, Sergeant Abbott. So I'm on the radio trying to talk to, to Maroika, and uh, I start hearing, hey, he, he, he's hit. And I'm like, well, get Sergeant Abbott. Get Sergeant Abbott on the radio. He's hit too. I'm like, oh, geez. So then uh, just as I'm kind of assessing the situation, I hear Cobra 6. That was my call sign. Cobra 6, Cobra 6. This is Cobra 1-6, which was first squad leader. And uh, he's like, I'm in, I'm in command of this platoon. And he led that platoon, what was left of it, like a hero. All right? Again, doing all the things that I talked about already, being that positive leader. Hey, we got this. And, and oh, by the way, try being positive when your platoon leader's been shot, your platoon sergeant's been hit with, mort with a mortar round, okay? I mean, just imagine. And this young staff sergeant grabbed the radio, took charge of that platoon, and took the fight to the enemy. And, and I'm going to tell you right now, at the end of that 18-hour fight, we, we were the victors. I was reading, reading a Facebook post from Sergeant Major Grippy this morning saying, yeah, hey, 20 years ago, we took an enemy kill box, which is what we landed in, into an American victory. And uh, he was right. And, and Staff Sergeant Perez uh, was part of that. Staff Sergeant Rappel, got a little picture of him from the newspaper down there, another hero of the battle. So... We did land on two HLZ. So remember I said I had two helicopters? I had first platoon on one, second platoon on the other. My company, my company headquarters and the battalion TAC across these two uh, helicopters. We, land on, we landed on two separate helicopter landing zones, really separated by a couple kilometers, okay? Uh, I was with first platoon, second platoon, uh, was, was the ones that were further away. Anyway, 
At that point in time, we were really fighting from two strong point positions. First platoon further up north towards Objective Remington, and then second platoon a, fur, you know, a little bit further south. We're, it's the same fight at both locations, though. And everyone is, is doing their absolute best you know, to, 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 to use discipline, use technology. And, but I'll tell you, Sergeant Rappel was getting a little bit impatient and, and started to identify some of, the, some of the key locations that we were taking enemy fire from. So on his own accord, he grabbed his squad and he started maneuvering up the mountain. And the next thing you know, you start seeing enemy positions explode and, and blow up. All right? Then he goes to another one. And I'm like, talk about initiative. Oh, my gosh. Now, I was getting a little concerned because I had an airstrike coming in really soon. All right? So I was a little bit worried about that. But that didn't take away... Okay, that didn't take away Sergeant Rappel leading that squad, fighting position to fighting position, killing the enemy, making things better for everybody on the ground. Hero of the battle, Staff Sergeant Rappel, and I loved him. I had a personal relationship with that guy as a company commander. Uh, he, he immigrated from Poland. I'm Polish, and uh, I tell you, we keep, we keep in touch to this day. Major Byrne. And I, for the life of me, I couldn't remember his name as I was putting this thing together, his first name. But he was a major, so you know what I called him? Sir, because I was a captain. All right, he was our doctor, okay? So we had a, a doctor assigned. We were the main effort of our battalion. We thought that, you know, the battalion had a doctor, and if anybody probably was going to need that doctor, it was going to be our company. So... The battalion commander gave me the doctor for this operation. And uh, I would tell you, as, as the fight continued on, this guy was absolutely fearless. And oh, by the way, like, his background, I mean, he was just a doctor. That's it. And, and, and nothing against doctors in the military, but, you know, they don't, they don't do this. You know, they, they don't, you know, <laughs> they're not all over the battlefield running all over the place. And he was... To the point where I tackled him at some point, and I said, Sir, if you go down, we lose all the wounded. We will bring them to you. Stay here. And he said, Okay. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but, but, and I tell you, you know, in, in a combat situation like that, I mean, you really, you do as it, however you did it in training is exactly how you're going to do it when the bullets are flying, when it's a two-way live fire, okay? And I, I would tell you, I don't think Major Byrne had ever been even in a training situation like that, but you know what he was trained to do? Treat wounded and keep people alive. And that's what he was doing. And, and he had plenty, you know, plenty of uh, soldiers to choose from, okay? But uh, because of his fearlessness because of his valor you know he's a hero to me now he didn't leave that that darn position I told you our, our company casualty collection point he, he didn't even think about leaving there the last guy command sergeant major Frank Grippy yeah uh, some people you know some people don't like being with you know, you know as you as you all go out and take charge of of of, of these units okay you know, for the most part, you know, some, most of you are going to be in charge of somewhere between, you know, for the, some of the specialty, specialty jobs as an officer in your service, could be as small as six people, but some of you are going to be leading up to 30, 40 soldiers, okay, or Marines, or Airmen, okay, or Coasties, and, uh, but when you go out in those units, you never want your boss with you, you're just like, because cause they're always going to tell you, hey, did you think of this? Are you doing this? Are you, you know, blah, 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 blah. And I'm just like, you know, nobody wants that. That was not the case. And I would just, full disclosure, I did not have a great relationship with my battalion commander. That guy was, was just stone cold. I mean, holy smokes. I mean, just never had, a personal, never had a personal conversation with him until the bullets started flying. And man, did, did that whole situation change. And, and, and I tell you, 
uh, we are the best of friends to this day. And, and, I, and I was very, very grateful that he was there with his command element during this fight because I probably wouldn't have gotten the support I needed from the Air Force, from the Navy, you know, from, from high up above if he wasn't there. And, 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 oh, by the way, he let me handle the fight on the ground. And uh, it was something else. But anyway, his sergeant major, Frank Grippy, is on the ground leading by example. So the senior enlisted soldier in this battalion is with my company. And he... He's like, hey, Nelson, I'm like, Sergeant Major. <laughs> He's like, you need to get something over here. They're moving up these wadis. And no kidding. You know, then he starts throwing grenades. I mean, the, you, you think of, and no kidding, throwing grenades at the enemy and, and shooting them. All right, as they were trying to maneuver in our position. And I was just watching him. And I'm like, man, that guy is fearless. And you know what that created? A bunch of fearless, non commissioned officers and a bunch of fearless soldiers. And it was just, it was just awesome to watch. And, uh, and, and he got shot. And uh, he was a little, a little too fired up, I think. And it, those of you that know Sergeant Major Grippy, there ain't anybody more fired up than him. All right? But uh, anyway, uh, he got shot. Guess what he did when he got shot? He got shot in the ass. All right? And, and guess what he did when he got shot? He kept fighting didn't slow him down a bit and that's why i'm talking about i texted him this morning i said hey i get to talk to our college's core cadets uh this morning about a, about an american hero command sergeant major frank grippy uh a guy that led by example a guy that was fearless a guy that set the example and i'm gonna just be honest with you i had been in a few firefights early on in afghanistan but nothing like this and to see that that example motivated me to be better, to be a better leader. And to this day, I mean, it, these were the, this, this battle that happened 20 years ago is what made me who I am today. I mean, it was, you know, people have a thing in their life that, that you know, what was the crucible in your life? You know, I, I've, I've got a couple, you know, but this is a big one, okay? So Frank Grippy, hero of the battle. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna hit this one real quick. They wrote a book, I've never read it. My wife did though, she, I, I, she showed me the parts I was in, I'm like, yeah, it's accurate, okay. Um, I don't know, I just, I'm just not interested in reading it. I, maybe, maybe someday I will, it's not because I, you, you probably notice I get a little choked up when I think about parts of this battle and, and, what, and what we went through. Um, the, uh, but for whatever reason, I'm just not interested in reading it. And there was a couple other books written too, Lester Grau, and, and he, he's, he's kind of neat. He wrote some books on when the Russians were in Afghanistan, so it was kind of neat. I did read parts of that. Uh, but anyway, concepts explored, tested, okay? So going into this, you know, the response from 9-11, right? Those in leadership positions at the highest level thought we could get this done with close air support, and special forces. Okay? We did, they did fantastic. The Air Force, the Navy, special forces, they did fantastic. But I'm going to tell you right now, in an operation like this, they needed more. You can't, and, and I think you're seeing some of the stuff going on in Ukraine. You know, the Russians are taking, are, are, are taking a piece of terrain, but they can't hold it because they don't have enough. So imagine how it is for a special forces team. Okay, so that was kind of, that was a concept tested. Another concept tested. Ah, oh, they don't need artillery. They got the Air Force. Oh, my goodness. Bad call. Don't ever go to a fight with arch art artillery. Air, and and, and, and that, that is not taking anything away from the other services. They're awesome, too, and you need them, too. But I tell you, the way the military fights, we fight as a combined arms team. And I think I told you all when you got here in the fall, you know, make the best of friends, especially with those that are different than you. Those going to the Air Force should be buddies with those in the Coast Guard because you're going to see each other later. And when it's a faraway land, you want to have that personal relationship that you established back at Georgia Military College. 
Cool? So, no artillery. I'm not going to talk any more on that, but it's a, that was a bad call. All right? Mortars, close combat, attack aviation, close air support. I'll tell you what, when you don't have artillery on the ground, you get really good at using those three things. To the point where, so we did the, you, you might have noticed on the first slide, Operation Anaconda was 18 days. It's kind of ironic. My, my company's fight that first day was 18 hours. But uh, anyway, um, we did follow on operations after that. We went and found more enemy positions, continued to take the fight to the enemy, and really turned around an operation that was, had a great plan, that didn't happen, turned into courage under fire, great leadership, and, and valor, and, and, we, and we, we did things. So instead of having artillery, we grabbed all our mortars and we made a firing battery out of them, just like we would the artillery. We used them like artillery. We used, the close, we, used air, we used the aviation, the attack aviation, every chance that we got. And we, I mean, like I said, you, whatever you do in, uh, in training is what you're going to do in combat. It was so neat. We trained those things, but never to the extent we, that we used them. And it was just, I mean, it was real. I, I'm just going to tell you, as a 30-year-old captain leading a bunch of steely-eyed, barrel-chested killers, you know, and, and having this, having those three things at, at, at our disposal changed the fight, and it was awesome. But I still wouldn't go anywhere without my artillery. I know Colonel Pitt's loving that. <laughs> All right, Air Force, Naval, Naval Aviation versus Ground Forces. So it was pretty funny. After Operation Anaconda, everybody won the fight, you know? And, and I would tell you it was pretty comical because uh, there's there are there are some that think you don't need ground forces to win in combat. Okay, all you need is just drop a bunch of bombs, you know, shoot shoot off a off a off of a ship, you know, what have you. And just kind of kind of showed that, and, and it, we've seen it time and time again. You need infantrymen on the ground, muddy boots on the ground, to win battles. To, to conduct operations and to win wars. It, but guess what? Those infantrymen on the ground can't do it without their artillery, can't do it without their aviation, can't do it without their intelligence, can't do it without the Air Force, the Navy. I came out of there saying, I love everybody. <laughs> I love every service because we employed everything in this fight. And, and I tell you, back in 2002, as an as a infantry officer, that was a dream come true. Now, I felt, I, you know, I, it really sucked that, you know, some of our soldiers got wounded, but they made it, okay? Um, and then the last point that I'd like to hit on this one is, everybody knows now, in the, in, the, in the Army at least, we have these things called brigade combat teams, okay? So there was talk about brigade combat teams back in 2002, they, but they didn't exist. And then... So that's 2002, 2003, what did we do? We went into Iraq too, right? And, and again, brigade combat teams weren't formed. But I think this, this fight led to the, the confirmation that when a unit goes to fight, they need to have all their stuff at their disposal. So a brigade combat team, instead of having an, just an infantry battalion, you know, and then an artillery battalion working over here and, a, and an engineer battalion working over here. All that stuff needs to belong to one guy or gal. And, and, it, and it's usually, in, in, in the Army, it's a brigade combat team. So this fight informed that. And I'll tell you, we use brigade combat teams as, as, the way we fight today. Okay, kind of neat. Next slide. All right, I'm going to hit these real quick because I know you guys are sick of hearing me talk. Uh couple pictures you this is hanging up in my office so uh during the fight um I always carry so I had two radios all right I carried a radio it was my company radio and that's where I talked to my, my lieutenants all right I had an RTO I had two RTOs but I'm like hey I'm just going to carry my own radio you guys go back you pull security or you know one of you pull security the other one you monitor whatever the battalion's going to say you know or anybody else that's trying to contact us on that net Anyway, during the fight, early on, I'm sitting there talking to, talking to the platoon leader, 
you know, another LZ and an RPG literally came right, I mean, so me to that, that chair right there, an RPG came down and stuck into the ground right there and didn't explode. And uh, Ogilvy was my, my, my RTO. He, he, he's, he wore glasses. He, I looked at him. His eyes were this big round. And he's like, and, you know, holy smokes. Uh, he didn't say that, but <laughs> Joe, Joe, <laughs> Joby told me, hey, keep it clean, sir. Uh, <laughs> but he's like, holy smokes, sir, we got to get out of here. And just as he said that, I did a combat roll out of my, out of my, out of my rucksack. And the next round came in and hit my rucksack. And I didn't, didn't have a scratch. Pretty awesome. But anyway, I grabbed that rucksack, and I didn't carry it around as I was checking on soldiers, but I'm like, that sucker's going back to the States with me when this thing's over because it's going to make a heck of a wall hanging. And no kidding, I had some folks, you know, doing museum displays, and they're like, hey, any way we can get that rucksack? I'm like, nope. Not while I'm alive. So it's in, it's in my office here if you want to come check it out. Uh, we did end up getting third platoon on the ground, okay, after that 18-hour fight. Uh, that's the lieutenant right there, Lieutenant Phil Philbrick. He was a third platoon leader. Uh, but that's a picture of him and I in, in, you know, in between operations. And, oh, by the way, th just remember, there's no cell, like, there ain't even cell phones, you know. And, and so if there ain't, a, you know, you had beepers back then. And then, and then, so you couldn't take, that picture wasn't from an iPhone. That picture was from a, a disposable camera, all right? Those were, those, were, those were big back then. I tell you, before we left on our deployment, we were stuffing these disposable cameras in our rucksacks saying, we're going to get some good pictures. And then, but we didn't know until we got back because we had to take it to the, to the pharmacy to get it developed. I mean, it was just something else. I know you can't fathom that, but those, that's what those pictures. And there's a the Chinook. Anyway, uh, some lessons learned during Anaconda. While it was very kinetic, very, you know, you know a lot, of, lot of, of, of shooting, you know, a lot of bombing, there were uh, some non-lethal things that we had to do to deal with the, with, the, with the population, okay? So counterinsurgency made a big comeback uh, during the war in Afghanistan, war, war in Iraq, and, and I think it, it was a result of some, some of the things that went on in Anaconda. Uh, confidence is still through rehearsals. So the 10th Mountain Division, guess what? We're light fighters. We don't have, now I don't know what they got, but back in those days, you know how you got to the fight and where you, you know, and how you move from position to position, location to location? Right here, these things. And you loaded up your rucksack and you walked, okay? If you could catch your eyes somewhere, you took it, but it was rare. You never got helicopters, okay? Well, here we are getting ready to conduct an air assault operation with the 101st, the, the masters of air assault. And the brigade commander, who retired as a three-star general, uh, Lieutenant General Rosinski, he was a colonel at the time, and I don't know, I, I don't know what, how he came to it, but he's like, you know what? That, that battalion... From, from the 10th Mountain. I know they don't do a lot of helicopter stuff, so I'm going to do a rehearsal. We're going we're to take helicopters. They're going to practice loading and unloading. They're going to fly, and they're going to learn how to do an air assault. And, and we all had all done it, but not to the level of going into a combat operation. C Colonel, Colonel Wazinski was brilliant. And the confidence, that, re that rehearsal, don't ever do anything without a rehearsal. Never. Guess what I was doing on Monday at 9 o'clock? Eddie will tell you, I was rehearsing. <laughs> because you don't have, especially, you know, as a leader, everybody's always looking at you. you got to rehearse, all right? And there's a real neat, you know, example of a rehearsal that paid big dividends. And I, you notice I throw on there, on the upcoming slide, I got an arrowhead. So during a conflict, you get a medal, right? Back then, it was the uh, Expeditionary, Global War on Terrorism Expeditionary Medal. Then you got an Afghan campaign medal, an Iraq camp. Anyway, back during World War II, they came up with this, this, this uh, attachment that goes on your medal called the arrowhead. And the only ones that get that arrowhead is if you parachute into a firefight 
you know, where, where actual bullets are flying. You air assault into a firefight, or you do a beachhead like Normandy. Do you want to talk about going into a fight? Holy smokes. But, uh, but it's kind of neat. Uh, our, whole, our whole battalion was awarded the Arrowhead for doing an air assault. Very unique. It, it's, it's probably one of the lowest ribbons on my uniform, but it's one I probably treasure the most. It's just really neat. Holy smokes. All right, next slide. Coming home. Go ahead and show the video. And Eddie, I'm going to have you cut it short. I'll let you know when. Upper left. Nope, nope, up, oh, top left. One, one. One, one. There we go. Go back to the slides. There we go. A couple other pictures. You know, I told you about that, that guy, that brilliant guy who did the air assault. That was Colonel Wazinski right there. There's, there's Lieutenant Maroika. Uh, got to officiate his retirement ceremony down at uh, SOCOM, uh, actually in March when COVID started. So that was crazy. They did a pretty cool, Don Stivers, a military artist, they did a print 
he painted a print from the from the fight, uh, brothers in battle, kind of neat. And there's me giving Sergeant Sakis at uh, uh, Arcom with V. So kind of neat. Next slide. All right, there's that arrowhead I talked to you about. Uh, a few more. There's the division commander, General Hagenbeck, went on to be the superintendent of West Point. But those are the those are some more pictures from the fight. Uh, on this 20th anniversary, it's uh, really been my honor to to share this experience with you. What are your questions? Well, I got time for a, for a couple. Yes, sir. Sorry about that. I'll stick around afterwards if you got more. Morning, sir. Morning. Uh, I'm Cadet Hall. I'm State Service ECP, and I'm a history major. I was wondering, like, on the, you know, it happened 20 years ago. What are some lessons um, from it that, you know, you wouldn't have known? Like, what are some things that you didn't know going into it that you can reflect on now and be like, oh, yeah, hindsight's 20 20, things like that? Well, I, I mean, I, I, I shared, th thanks, go ahead, sit down. Um, I shared the major lessons learned uh, that, that I've carried forward. Uh, prob probably, probably the, 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 the three, you know, well, four. Number one, everybody supports the infantry. All right? That's pretty awesome. That's an awesome place to be. So those of you that are thinking about what you want to do in the military, the infantry is a great place to be. Uh, leadership matters. Rehearsals matters. And don't ever go to a fight without your artillery. Next question. Yes, sir. Hello, sir. My name is Raymond Schultz. I'm an ECP cadet from Columbus, Mississippi. And uh, you said there were experiences from heroes such as Command Star and Major Grippa during Operation Anaconda. But were there any bad experiences during the uh, battle that taught you a lot about leadership as well? Um, yeah, there was, uh, there were, unfortunately, there were some leaders that, uh, that, that, that got shell shock uh, during this fight. Go ahead, take a seat. Yes, sir. Um, and, uh, you know, I did what I could to motivate them and inspire them to do their job, and uh, they never quite came around. So, uh, so that was, that was uh, a negative thing, you know, obviously, but, but, but what we dealt with it. And I, and I would tell you, having spent pretty much, this was the start of basically four years in combat operations for me, uh, that was something that I was always looking for because if a leader goes down because of because of whatever reason they, they can't handle the fight they're they're scared to death what have you just just remember that that positive example I gave of, of Sergeant Major Grippy you know he, he was inspiring a lot of folks but the, the other the other soldiers were looking for for inspiring leadership too and and, and some of them didn't get it and and we dealt with that but there's a there's a negative thing for you any other questions Last two, right there. Yep, you. Morning. You're good. Just sound off. And uh, my there he goes. My question was: after what you experienced during Operation Anaconda, how did that change the way you led your men, soldiers in general? Well, I'll tell you. <laughs> great question. So, and, and I'm sorry. This is the last question. Um, go ahead, have a seat. So going into this fight, I'm just going to be honest. I, I, I didn't consider myself the greatest leader. Um, I, I wanted to be the best in everything, and I probably pushed a little too hard. I was probably, you know, there's nothing wrong with pushing, but I probably pushed a bit, a little too hard trying to be the best in everything. I kind of sweated everything. I was a walking basket case with just, you know, I just, everything had to be perfect. Everything had, we had to be the best in everything that we did. And, uh, you know, going through a firefight like that made me realize I'm glad I pushed my soldiers and my leaders to do the things that we did in training because we succeeded in combat because of that. But some of the periphery stuff that I was sweating, worrying about, uptight about, you know, man, I, 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 shed, I shedded that. Uh, after this combat operation. I, I, just, I, I enjoyed life a little bit more. I cared a little bit more. Uh, it, it, just, it had a positive uh, uh, effect on my leadership with, with, with those that I led. I just became a, I think I became more of a real leader and, and hopefully, 
hopefully my soldiers would say the same that, that, that I served, served with, you know, following that, but great question. Okay, hey, uh, great, great time being with you this morning. Thank, thank you for letting me share it. 20 years, holy smokes, but uh, appreciate y'all.